Okay, thanks, Charlie. Really. Um, I should realize I'm going to move this a little bit. Um, I realized in my in my talk today I didn't wasn't going to say anything about myself. I really said most of it. Um, my my graduate work actually had, um, I did a project on um, um, healthcare systems and understanding healthcare systems. So it's not it's not public health per se, and I'm not going to necessarily talk about it here, but um, uh, it's. Um, an interesting, an interesting space, and, and thank you for having me here today. Um, so let's see here. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know I'm being recorded, so I want to make sure make sure I've got everything everything correctly here. Um, okay. Today I'm going to talk about the intersection of design and public health um, by sharing some uh, industry examples and uh, and projects that I've contributed uh, to. Uh, with students. Uh, so I'm a designer with a background in, in graphic design, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, my graduate work is, is also more on the design management, design thinking side. So I'm, some of the, what I'm talking about today sort of blends design thinking and graphic design, but my background is in graphic design. Um, so while public health hasn't been a significant part of my life's work to date, uh, some recent projects and interests have led me um, to explore uh, this direction. Um, so first, I'd like to say a few words about the title of my talk, uh, which I think needs some explanation. Uh, the two books that, uh, that are ins have inspired the title, uh, one is Where There Is No Doctor, Village Healthcare Handbook by David Werner, which was originally published in 1977. Uh, the other is Design for Care, Innovating Healthcare Experiences by Peter Jones, uh, recently published in, in 2013. Um, so as a boy growing up on this isolated Pacific Coast beach uh, in Mexico, uh, yes, it actually did happen. There's people from all around the world I know here. Um, but there were, there were no doctors. My, my parents were, uh, were, the, were the doctors here. Um, and I did visit a doctor about once a year. But I called my parents the doctors because the book uh, I recall them referencing was, was Werner's Handbook. Uh, and it covers many health issues. Uh, from diarrhea to malaria to ringworm to hygiene, uh, diet, nutrition, um, and vaccination. Uh, and explains what people can do on their own to prevent, recognize, and treat many common sicknesses. And I recall looking through the illustrations, um, which in some respect told the story of, of many of the conditions that were, that were around at the time um, and what to do about them. So I have vivid memories about you know, all of these and sort of taking the book and looking through them and trying to understand what was going on. So I think pictures, uh, pictures were, were a part of that. Uh, and while it, it, uh, it targets health workers, Werner clearly states that the, that the book is for all who take part in his or her village. It's a very different um, from the health information that I look at today, but still I've, I have vivid memories of the illustrations uh, because they, yeah, they depicted the, the life around me uh, and, and really sort of informed taking care of myself today. Uh, on the opposite end, Jones looks at the experience of engaging with, with healthcare systems and management perspectives. Um, while he addresses the relationship between doctors and patients and the village of support and one's journey when ill, he also explores how we might develop better collaborations to support health more broadly and eliminate barriers to understanding by really facilitating a, a seamless care experience. I think Jones's ideas are, are relevant to, to public health in that he thinks about the continuum of health and how it intersects with care experiences, as well as knowledge we can gain in our own, um, in, on our own uh, as it's disseminated in many ways. Um, so while they're, they're fairly, different, fairly different books, uh, Werner's focused on, on sort of the individual and the, and the symptoms, and, and Jones more on the, on the, the system of care. Um, they made me sort of question how design might work with public health and health in general um, to communicate and facilitate our ability to make better, better health decisions. So I, I really, I strongly believe that design, when design's used well, it can go really a long way towards supporting health and possibly those times when there is no doctor, right? Uh, we take sort of our, our, own, our own conditions, um, what, what can we do about our own conditions when there is no doctor? Okay, before uh, discussing some examples, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about some basics of visual design. 
uh, and the design process and what I, what I mean by it. Specifically, what do graphic designers add to any project uh, when they work with other disciplines? This is your uh, one minute overview of, of graphic design. So one of the most important uh, criteria is hierarchy, which refers to the relative prominence of elements in a given environment. We tend to perceive elements with greater prominence first and understand them to be more important. So hierarchy can be implementing using contrast, scale, color, weight, grids. In this map, I'll see this okay? Yes. Uh, in this map, each hue represents a different level of aggressiveness of, health, of abortion law. Red is easy to differentiate from orange and yellow, et cetera, but those colors also have value range in which, in which the darkest color represents the strongest anti-abortion laws, while the lightest values represent the weakest. And because the darkest areas have the greatest contrast with the white background, countries with the most aggressive laws stand out the most. Deborah Adler's uh, target prescription labeling uses color systems as well to shift, as well as a shift in type size with clear white space around the text to support legi uh, the legibility and the sequence of the information. And in contrast to the Walgreens label, you can see the majority of the type is all the same and it's very compact, so it's, it's very difficult to read. And I think actually in, in labeling of health, health of medicines, this is a big area where designers uh, can play an important role in um, in clarifying the information. Another important design element, this is not health related, but another important uh, design element is micro and macro relationships. Uh, in this poster, blurs align between the figure and ground, creating another compelling image within the larger image. Framing of an image uh, is also uh, an important part of understanding the, the content uh, being presented and how we crop and frame images. Uh, using layers and transparency, uh, as in this graphic, can also support ideas and how data are, are related to each other. So these are, these are some tools that designers use to create compelling stories and messages, information from posters to signage um, and stories. Uh, other, other strategies can include wit, humor, metaphors, analogy, interaction, motion uh, that contribute to, the, to sort of the, the range of visual communications. Um, that designers are involved with. I'm speaking here mostly about graphic design, uh, the graphic design area. Okay, so the design process. Um, what about it? Um, as with many disciplines, it can vary. Uh, there is often seems to be this mystery, I think, around, uh, or this magic around the design process, um, which can sometimes look like this in, in the professional world. Uh, Tim Brennan's Apple from um, uh, Apple's creative team, sort of the squiggly line. Um, another is by Damien Newman of Central Office. Begins to have sort of some general categories, but still illustrates what is often a, a very messy beginning. A more complex uh, system that incorporates business and technology might look like this by Alan Cooper, uh, called a goal-directed design process. And Cooper has uh, similarities to, uh, to design thinking, uh, which I, I won't go uh, deep into the design thinking process as it, as it relates to graphic design, but it's worth noting that much more uh, complex challenges of today, sometimes what we call wicked, wicked problems, uh, can, can follow this, this approach. Uh, and really graphic design is one component, uh, or the design and interactivity is one component of this larger framework of, of design thinking. One of, my, uh, one of my favorites is Hugh Doverly's illustration of the creative process. And the reason I love this one because it sort of synthesizes the process into this layered concentric circles, uh, which really reflects sort of the iterative process of, of design. So in, in this, and also part of the reason that I like it is that he, uh, he incorporates uh, a lot of different processes into, into this sort of this idea of concentric circles. So I, I'm sure you can see your own process uh, for, for creating uh, new ideas and innovations uh, within, the, within these diagrams. Uh, but one of, one of the things that I think unites all disciplines in the world of design and visual arts is that the process requires us um, to make what we think visual and physical. Okay? Uh, we collect stuff, we post it up on walls and the studios, it gets very messy, 
um, often creating these large collages of visual documentation in order to analyze it, to then synthesize it into ideas that lead to prototypes, and finally then a design solution. Uh, so these, these are images from uh, the Sam Fox School, the design studio gets very messy, the architecture spaces get even messier uh, with all kinds of things all over, all over the place. Um, but I think it's part of the, the sort of the design culture and, and the idea of, of making things with your hands. Um, so it, it, it's, it's messy, but, but I, again, uh, making the ideas visual through drawings, collages, physical prototypes is really what allows us to test the idea and then to make connections between them uh, in order to arrive to the best solution. And this is from uh, Philips, Philips Design, their, their innovation area where they're, they're doing stuff up on the walls also in terms of trying to imagine new, new processes for, for uh, some of the, the products that they're making. Okay, so now some, uh, some industry examples I wanted to share with you. Uh, the nutrition label is one of my favorites because it has stood the test of time and represents sort of the fundamentals of good typography and hierarchy. Uh, the original was designed over 30 years ago uh, and had a clear design strategy of organizing the type and the rules and has really held up pretty well um, over, over time. Uh, however, a new proposed design has been introduced because of the new understandings uh, from nutrition science, and these include that calorie intake and serving size are important in addressing our current public health concerns such as obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. So by increasing the type size of the calorie and the serving size, they put greater emphasis in comparison to other elements, or changing the percentage, the percentage daily value to be first in the list also addresses the need for sort of greater attention and, and clarification of, of sort of this critical information in the context of our daily, our daily diets. Um, so it's an artifact that's, that's now had, a, had an evolution, but it's an example of what graphic design uh, can contribute in understanding information that, that impacts our health. A slightly more complex example is the use of symbol graphics in healthcare settings. And this one was produced in 2003 by a, a group called Hablamos Juntos. Uh, and it really sought to address the challenges of multi-language users in health settings, uh, which is an in, um, increasing challenge for many systems across the United States and, and really the world. Um, the project was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and administered by the UCSF Fresno Center for Medical Education and Research. Uh, so it was part of the School of Medicine. And it really sought to, thought to, sought to develop uh, an easy to understand visual language for non-English speakers to navigate health facilities. Uh, and all of these are, if, if you go to uh, this organization called the Noun Project, you can use these for free in addition to a whole host of other uh, graphic icons. It's a great, it's a great project. Uh, but this multi-year year, uh, experiment um, came up with, this, with this, this final set. So this type of research by design, uh, designers has been ongoing really around the world from uh, India to Brazil to Japan. These are a few that have been explored in, in other countries. And I think the, the biggest challenge is always sort of understanding what the cultural norms of, of, of that particular country are and sort of what the literacy levels are. Uh, and then, you know, how do we how do we use those in those in those particular contexts? Um, but I think that it, the research has shown that a lot of these are much more effective in sort of increasing understanding and especially in, in low literacy literacy areas. So to elaborate a little further and sort of maybe more of an application uh, example of this. Um, this project titled Health Communication Tools Empowering the People of Kibera Through Design and Collaboration uh, was initiated by a team out of Kent uh, University School of Visual Communication Design. And uh, Penina Akayo, uh, who's actually an incoming professor in the Sam Fox School, we're very excited to have her next year. Uh, she was on this project um, and, and on the team that developed this. And really the, the project sought to provide visual communication tools to the people of Kibera, Kenya and, and to reinforce sort of health-seeking habits with regards to malaria. So the, the existing solutions were very text-heavy uh, information. And through the research and the prototype development, the team created posters, information leaflets, symptom icons, uh, 
uh, children activity books and, and a brand campaign for, uh, for, the, for the people there. And they tested this on the ground and, and really did conclude that the clarity of the symbol-based symbol system was more effective uh, than the text-heavy information from the, the manufacturers, which was a typical way that most of the people were receiving information about, about malaria. Okay, so I wanted to talk a little about a couple projects here at WashU that, uh, that I've been involved with. And, and this one uh, in particular is, is um, a project that was led by uh, principal investigators Heather Corcoran. Um, she's the, now the director of the College and Graduate School of Art. Matt Cruder, who's an associate dean of public health. Uh, you may all, all know him. And uh, Christina Clark, who's an epidemiologist at the Cancer Prevention Institute of California. And the project called Maximizing Social Impact of Cancer, Re Cancer Registry Data uh, sought, sought to develop more effective visual strategies to communicate cancer data to the public. So it's really, it's really looking at the intersection of, of data design and communications. And I think we've all seen this sort of, uh, this sort of graphic information, whether it's uh, in print or in textbooks, uh, or even on the National Cancer Institute uh, website and many others uh, where you're presented with, with very sort of dense information about a particular topic. So through a process of visual development, which also involved students at the Sam Fox School, uh, the team explored a number of strategies to arrive at, at three directions uh, that, they would, that they eventually uh, did test. And so they test, with each one of them, they tested over 200 people uh, were interviewed. Uh, and the preliminary results uh, showed that Im improved visual design helped people answer sort of more factual questions uh, more readily uh, when compared to the existing data, uh, which was often, again, very text heavy. And this is an example of a, of a, a federal website and the type of information that was, that was being uh, recreated based on the same, same data for uh, cancer registry in California. And so I, what I was talking about earlier about hierarchy information, this is using color, size, as well as typography to really communicate an idea here. Another uh, test included visual narratives uh, to determine how the public audiences might understand health data in a story format that used a, a combination of pictures, text, and data. So here's more of a, of a narrative story uh, talking about uh, smoking rates in the state of Missouri. And this, again, also uh, showed, showed a, a more understanding as far as, uh, as, far as people's, people's ability to sort of comprehend the data. So one aspect of the, of the and there was, there was one other which I'm not showing, but one aspect of the project uh, that was fascinating to me that over a, a two-year time frame of, of the study, it took, it, it took almost a year for the, the team of, of, of researchers and students and sort of everybody involved to sort of get to know each other, both from the design and the public health side, and to really sort of come up, and this was, this was sort of the model that uh, began to emerge about, you know, how do, we, how do we work together? This idea of a designed artifact in the middle, um, how do we uh, get attention, understanding, and elaboration to, uh, to, to be communicated through this designed art artifact, and so we use principles of visual design to, to, to do that. Uh, and, and from 2004 to 2010, a, a project that I was involved with at the San Francisco School was called the, uh, the Visual Communications Research Studio. And this was sort of a, a combination of design, um, design and research in a sort of an applied sense. And um, we were fortunate enough to, to work on this project for a, for a Missouri Baptist called the Cardiac and Vascular Education Room. And so uh, this, um, this team really partnered with, uh, with all the experts uh, at Missouri Baptist and, and education and sort of tried to ask, you know, what, what, is, what is at the, at the heart of heart education uh, and, and to figure out who our target audience was and really, really dig deep into, into, this, into this topic. Uh, given the complexity of the information, the visuals needed to be clear and concise and use graphic images to simplify complex information. So here are some explorations that the, that the team went through and the illustrators on the team were, were involved with. So very, very for complex diagrams of, of a heart and then how do, you, how do you simplify this or bring analogy into the idea of how something works. 
um, and, and, and teaching someone about, about a heart. So this is an example of, of what occurred on the project from, a, from some of the visuals. And then we also created uh, environments uh, that uh, are mock-ups. We tested the typography in the environment. Uh, we actually printed out these large-scale um, uh, visuals and went into the environment and, and sort of tested, tested the, uh, the ideas. So the goal was really to create uh, greater knowledge about the condition and increase motivation to address disease management as well as how to accomplish lifestyle changes. So we, had, we incorporated uh, both animation, exhibition, uh, as well as sort of these diagrammatic uh, visuals uh, through the environment. And ultimately this led to them implementing this in other parts of the hospital. Um, and, I, and I use this sort of as an example of Again, graphic design and more on the health side or the clinical side, but, but I think this is an example of how it can impact public health in a, in a, in a broader way. So some more recent uh, work, we've partnered with uh, BJC Hospital as part of uh, interaction and human-centered design classes to explore transportation challenges, as well as how to facilitate and motivate healthy eating and exercise habits. Uh, so students were involved in primary and secondary research with participants to gain insights, often in a very visual and participatory way. And uh, the students uh, create these sort of maps of, of sort of the stories that they, that they go out and find, sort of these journey maps of information. And then another, another tactic that the, that the students uh, that we use is, is really doing a story or a narrative of what that experience is like. And even though these are, these are illustrators doing this, uh, you can use stick figures to create what is the narrative that's, that's occurring, whether it's transportation or healthy eating habits, and really find out what, what are the sort of the trigger points where you can create an intervention or some kind of a, of a graphic um, visualization of information or whether it's a service to, to help support that. So even though the, the, the outcome in this particular case was, a, uh, was a, an app, it was part of a whole service experience with transportation and getting a patient to the hospital and back, uh, as well as using, using an app. And that was really only uncovered through a whole host of, of interviews and, and really mapping the story out. Um, we have a lot of students working on interaction type projects, but also the interaction, when I say interaction design, it can also be uh, printed material and how do you uh, navigate and encourage a participant to really follow a particular path or, or be involved in, in something. In this particular case, it was the um, uh, elderly patients in sort of the waiting room environment and being nervous about the whole experience. And this little kit provided them with sort of comfort uh, to, to experience that, that in a more seamless way. So switching, uh, switching design disciplines a little bit, um, I'm going to divert from graphic design. I'd like to touch on architecture and urban design, in part because it's part of the Sam Fox School, um, but how, how does it intersect with, with public health? And there, there are two areas in which the complexity, these are, these are two areas, urban design and architecture, are areas in which the complexity and variables of the stakeholders can make for really challenging scenarios, often what is referred to as, as wicked problems again if we were dealing with, with an entire city, for example. So I'm encouraged by this quote and by the growing body of research and interest at the intersection, especially in the design community. So here at here Washington University, uh, Christine Honer of the, of the medical school and Jody Rios of the Sam Fox School, along with many others at the university, conducted this health impact assessment in Pagedale which was actually supported in part by uh, the Institute for Public, Public Health, um, along with a number of other, other funders. Uh, and the intent was really to evaluate a planned new development and make recommendations in order to support better decision making at multiple levels by the community and local governments. And the study was able to, to make five recommendations to support healthy community development. And they included improved pedestrian infrastructure, in the short term, planting orchards and gardens, supplementing physical improvements with education and programming, 
and prioritizing spaces and programs for, for youth recreation and fostering uh, stakeholder engagement, which I think is, is one of the biggest challenges with, with the built environment is really getting everybody on board where there's so many people involved in these projects. So they're, they're neither simple nor short-term fixes, but what is great about uh, the mounting uh, health impact assessment studies and other research of its kind, uh, including uh, the work that Aaron Hipp is doing here at, at the university, um, is really informing policymakers and communities about how to be more engaged um, with the physical environment and its impacts for health. So what is clear is that design is finding more relevance in, uh, to the health world um, and, and many other disciplines. And, uh, and lastly, sort of to build on this idea further, uh, this is uh, an active design guidelines that are recently published by the New York City Department of Design and Construction, Health and Mental Hygiene, Transportation, and City Planning. So really this, this multi-agency organization uh, is, is developing this forward-thinking effort to translate academic research into practical recommendations for the design community. Um, but also, I think, for the broader community and how to, how to address um, the built environment in cities. And it's really not, not one single strategy, but a whole host of things. So there's, there's certainly a, a long history of, of these types of, of uh, projects um, that address healthy lifestyles. And, and Olmsted, uh, Frederick Olmsted, and the conception of, of Central Park was, was actually one of those, uh, where he thought of that as a, as a public health um, environment uh, to really support the city. Uh, these, these books really bring also a, a fresh look at these issues and provide methods to study, assess, plan, and really better activate environments uh, and streetscapes. So it's, it's really a, a, great, a great collaboration. So I've given you a, a number of projects to think about today uh, and how design can work with health. Um, if public health is charged with really preventing problems from happening or recurring through a number of educational um, research and, and research strategies, then I think, I think design has a role to play in really facilitating uh, knowledge of complex information via tangible or intangible solutions that really consider data, process, interactions, services, or environments. Um, I think, so I think this, this, uh, this partnership is, is, is really terrific and, and uh, great to see happening. Um, so many times consumers don't have the benefit of a doctor to explain the symptoms or preventative measures. Uh, so how do, how, do we, how do we come to get that knowledge? And I think visual design is, is, one, is one mechanism for doing that. Uh, this, is a, this is just a, a set of heart uh, graphics that were conceived in the UK to sort of talk about uh, heart. And I think that it's just a, an, another example of sort of like the variety of ways in which visuals can support understanding of a concept. These are, these are sort of more one idea kinds of things, but I think uh, is it sort of a fun way to think about uh, design. Okay, thank you.